Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 13. We've been working through the book of Acts, which is the story of the Christian church starting after the death and resurrection of Christ. And this far in the story, uh, we, there are two, essentially two Christian churches. Uh, there is the church in Jerusalem and the church in Antioch. And so we're going to pick up in chapter 13, verse 13, and read through verse 43. Uh, this is the word of God. It says, Now Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel a prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let me know to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts of Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. And this is the Word of God. So we said that so far in this story, we've got essentially two Christian churches. You've got the one in Jerusalem, and you've got the one in Antioch, and it's we saw last week the Holy Spirit called the church in Antioch to set apart for him Barnabas and Paul that they might go out and do some missionary activity. And so last week we saw them go to the island of Cyprus uh, where they shared the gospel. They shared it with the governor of Cyprus in the capital city, Paphos, and he indeed came to faith. And now where we are in the story, they've left Paphos and they have traveled on 
and they traveled to this other city uh, called Antioch of Pisidia. Now, this is a different Antioch than the one they left from. There were many Antiochs in the Roman-controlled areas, much like there's a Jacksonville, North Carolina, and there's a Jacksonville, Florida. So there was an Antioch over here and an Antioch over there, and yet another third Antioch over in another place. And so they had gone there to share the gospel, and they did the same thing there that they did in Cyprus, which was when they arrived, the first thing they did is they went to the synagogue. And when they arrived, for some reason, we're not told, they were asked if they had something to share. Now, one thing that we, we note here at the beginning of this chapter, we find that John Mark has left their company before they get to this area. Um, John Mark, we know, as we, we saw before, was the nephew of Barnabas. And he had traveled with Barnabas and Paul on their journey to Cyprus to share the gospel. Now here, we're not told why he left, uh, but there is some uh, thought as to, as to why that might be. And, and it comes through the, 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 the fact that we notice here that the, the order in the names that are mentioned have switched. Up to this point, whenever we read of Barnabas and Paul, we see their names listed just as that. Set apart Barnabas and Saul to me, that they might engage in the work I have called them to. And when they arrived in Cyprus, it's, it's Barnabas and Saul. But now here in chapter 13, starting in verse 13, we read now Paul and his companions. And so it will be here on out. It's going to be Paul and Barnabas rather than Barnabas and Paul. And that has led some people to conjecture that's what's happened is Paul has now stepped forward as in the lead role on these missionary activities. And Mark, the nephew of Barnabas, for some reason, didn't like those arrangements. We don't know, um, but we do know that once we get to Acts chapter 15, we're going to have Barnabas saying that he'd like for John Mark to rejoin he and Paul as they continue on in their missionary activity. And Paul uh, stands against that idea. Um, but anyway, that's kind of a little trivial note, I suppose, on the side. But where we are now is that they are now in Antioch, and they are in a synagogue, and the leaders of the synagogue ask Paul and Barnabas if they have something to say. And here we find Paul delivering the first sermon of his that we have on record. Now, there's something that we need to notice here about this sermon. This is not the way... Paul preached everywhere he went. This was not his go-to sermon he kept in the back of his pocket when he has an opportunity to share about Jesus. Paul is sharing his message, and he knows this. He is sharing it with a very biblically literate congregation. They know the Word. They devote themselves to the Word. When he references these stories that he's referenced, they will know what stories he's talking about. But if we flip ahead, which we, we will do here in a number of weeks, and come to Acts chapter 17, we're going to find Paul preaching again. But it's going to be an altogether different kind of sermon. In this case, he's going to be preaching in Athens to the Greeks at the Areopagus. These are not people of the word. These are philosophers. These are people who have many different gods that they're worshiping. In fact, at the Areopagus, we're told that there are all these um, statues around to, to various gods. And he sees one that is listed as the unknown god, and he decides to use that as his launching point. But instead of starting with the word and the stories of the words, what's he do? In Acts chapter 17, he takes them to creation. He says, consider the world around you and what you see in what God has made. And once you've done that, now I'm going to lead you along and bring you ultimately to Christ. The simple point that I want to make here is that when we are sharing the good news, we need to take special care to understand where the people are that we are talking to. And we need to meet them where they are. Certainly, it's more comfortable for us to talk about and from the place where we are. You know, that's the world we live in. But the people we speak to, oftentimes, they're not there. 
Oftentimes they don't even understand the core concepts of what we talk about. I like something that Rodney said on Wednesday night. We were talking, we were, on Wednesday nights we are working through the, um, the, the Lord's Prayer. And we were talking about God as Father, which we've actually been doing for the last several weeks. Uh, but we were talking about God as Father, and Rodney made the observation that people have had a variety of different life experiences growing up. And for some people, that imagery of Father is not as appealing as it is to others. Because some people have had very rough upbringings. And that we need to be careful, um, and just, just sensitive, maybe is a better word. Uh, and how we approach uh, that topic. So I, I asked him simply, I said, well, Rodney, um, what do you do in those types of situations? How, how, do you, how do you demonstrate that sensitivity? How do you respond? And his answer was simply, you do a lot of listening. I think it's so good and so true. We need to be sure that we are spending time listening to people, because we are so eager to speak to people that oftentimes we, we jump the gun, and oftentimes we take off down a course that they are not able to keep up with us on. But we need to listen to them. We need to try to understand where they are, and then speak to them there. And I, I'm afraid sometimes what we do is even in our listening, we, we try to direct them where we want them to go. Of course, we want to direct them to Christ. But I know that I've been guilty at times in, in asking, prompting questions that's, that's intent has been to try to get them in the corner so then I can finally get to my point. And that's just not perhaps the right way to go about things. But simply to listen, hear, and ask for the Lord to give you wisdom to be able to speak to them exactly where they are. And that is the example that we're given in Paul. As we look at his, the variety of ways in which he engages people. Now here, in this setting, Paul, again, he understands. These people understand the word. They're familiar with the word. And Paul's basic thrust in this message is this. What God has promised, he has fulfilled. God is a promise-making, promise-keeping God. Now let's see how he makes his argument. And look at these uh, different sections. So verses 16 through 19. Here you've got Paul relating how God chose the people of Israel. How he multiplied them while they were in Egypt. He made them great. And it says, and with uplifted arm, he delivered them out of Egypt. And after delivering them out of Egypt, it says that God had to put up with the Israelites. their complaining, their rebellious attitudes. And yet, he remained true to his promises and fought for them by destroying seven nations in order that they might receive the land as he said they would. And so as it, that led to us referring to it as the promised land. It was the land that God had promised to them. And he fulfilled that promise. And so then Paul moves in verse 20 to the time of the judges. Which was largely a time of, of the people of Israel again acting in rebellion against God. But God continuing to show his faithfulness to his word and his promises by sending them judges. Who would call them to repentance. And continually deliver them from their enemies. Now when Paul says that he gave them these judges. He's preparing the hearers for the next section in which God gives them a king. So in verses 21 and 23. Just as God had given the people of Israel judges. He gives them the king that they asked for. Now God gave them Saul who didn't prove to be a very good king. That's not God's fault, so that was Saul's. And it makes you wonder when he, Paul notes that he was king for 40 years, if he's making a link there to the 40 days that the people of Israel spent in the wilderness, because both really were times of wandering. In verse 22, we read how God removes Saul and raises up David 
Now, of course, the people hearing this, being familiar with the word, know or knew the promises that God had made to David. 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 16 reads, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you. You shall come from your body, and I will establish your kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. And your house and your kingdom will be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever, God promised to David. Now then in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, the passage that is so familiar to us uh, during the time of Christmas. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there shall be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Deal of the Lord of hosts will do this, is the prophet Isaiah. This is the promise of God, and he will do it. So Paul is pointing out that these promises were fulfilled in So then verses 24 through 29, although John the Baptist in the spirit of Elijah came proclaiming the advent of Christ as God had promised, those in Jerusalem did not recognize Jesus as the fulfillment of the promises. And because they did not understand the promises that, had, that God had made through the prophets, they end up fulfilling those very promises. Because among those promises was that this one that the father would send would be the suffering servant. Our sins would be placed upon his back. That he would indeed, though not be personally guilty for anything, be executed as a criminal crucified and put in a tomb. But verses 30 through 37, God raises Jesus up from the dead, fulfilling the promises of God. We see and places light. And Paul, listen here, Psalm 2, both Psalm 16, Isaiah 55. So God has shown himself consistently to be a God who does what he says he will do. Now, how important is that for us to understand and to know? I mean, considering the world that we live in, and looking around at our culture, and looking around especially during this political season where we've got this drumbeat of voices saying, well, he promised this and he didn't keep his promises. I will be the one to keep my promises. And then that person responded back, are you kidding me? He didn't keep this. All those promises he made, he didn't keep those. I'll be the one who actually keeps my promises. You know, keeping one's promises is such a rarity these days that it's actually treated as if it's something extraordinarily praiseworthy. And so in times like these, we can find comfort that our God stands before us as the other than. He is other than everyone we know, other than anyone who takes the stage here on earth. He is the promise keeping God. Now, people hear people change their minds, circumstances cause them to alter their plans. Um, this happened to the apostles just as much as it, it happens to you and me. Me, but God's promises, they are unfailing, unchangeable, always fulfilled. And this must be so because this speaks to his nature and to his character. You know, when a person 
we know makes a promise and fails to keep it and marks him as what? A, a, a liar, perhaps? Maybe incompetent? At the least, not having foresight or not having the power to do what they thought that they were going to be able to do. But God is not hindered by any of these things. His character is unassailable. His power is unmatched. And by definition, it must be. Any God that is hindered in their knowledge or in their power is no God at all. Any God who is deceptive in his dealings with man is not a God worthy of praise. But if there is one true God, he must be, by definition, a promise-keeping God. And this is who we have in the scriptures. And this closely relates to the providential dealing that God has with his people. Our confession states this in chapter 5.1, so good. It says, God, the good creator of all things and his infinite power and wisdom, doth uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his most wise and holy providence, to the end for which they were created, according unto his infallible not foreknowledge, and the free and immutable counsel of his own will, to the praise of his glory, of his wisdom, power, justice, infinite goodness, and mercy. And so the same way, we might say that because he upholds, directs, disposes, and governs all creatures and things, we are able to trust his promises, and in doing so, we respond. And praise of his wisdom, power, justice, infinite goodness, and mercy. And that should bring us confidence in his word. We know that since God is the author of scripture and that God is truthful, and because he is one who does what he says he will do, We know that not only will all the scriptures be fulfilled, but we know that they are consistent. They are not contradictory. You know, we hear many voices out there who will try to argue with us and say, you know, I believe the Bible, if it weren't for all the contradictions in it. And of course, uh, the first response to that is, I'd be happy for you to show me one. Because it's not, not only true, not only not true, that the Bible has contradictions, but it cannot be true. Because of the nature of the word and the nature of the, nature of the one who authored it. Therefore, any supposed contradiction is simply that. Supposed. There's been many claims the supposed contradictions, but the thing that all of these contradictions have in common is that they aren't. It's usually verses taken out of context or a misunderstanding of the terminology, a misunderstanding of theology. We have one right here in chapter 13. Paul says, well, we know Jesus was crucified on the cross. Scriptures are clear on that. And yet here Paul says in verse 29 that he was taken down from the tree. And there will be those who go, oh, there you go, oops, a contradiction. What is it, a cross or is it a tree? Apparently your Bible doesn't know. How can you believe such a thing? Well, first, let, let's understand that Paul saying tree instead of cross, in a sermon would not, by definition, be a contradiction. It could simply be that Paul misspoke and Luke accurately wrote down what it was that Paul said. Understand, Paul's writing down, this is what Paul said to the synagogue. But that's not what happened. I mean, Luke did write down what Paul said. But it wasn't Paul making a mistake. What was Paul doing? Well, if you look up in the Oxford Dictionary, it's interesting, they, they make note of this, and they say, well, the use of tree is an archaic 
term just referring to anything that was made out of wood. So you could say, well, that kind of explains it. Paul's just using tree as some generic term that includes everything made of wood, and that would include a cross. Uh, but I don't think that's what's going on either. Um, it is interesting, by, by the way, that Peter, in fact, calls it a tree as well in Acts 5.30. And so here you've got Peter talking to the council that oversaw the synagogue, saying that Jesus was hung on a tree. Here you've got Paul talking to a bunch of folks in a Jewish synagogue, also using this language of tree. What is it that he's doing? Well, both of these groups knew the Jewish law very well, and they were trying to reach out to them to get them to understand what it was that took place when Jesus died upon the cross. And he knew that they knew that in Deuteronomy 21, there would be this. Quote, you must not leave the body on the tree overnight, meaning someone who had been executed. You cannot leave their body on the tree overnight, but be sure to bury it that same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is a curse of God. Now, that's pretty shocking language to be referencing, to, to use um, and for Paul to try to use in reference to the cross in Christ. But hear what Paul does with this later in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. He says this, The Messiah redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He knew, Paul knew that Jesus was hung upon a cross, and so he provides this interpretation of Deuteronomy 21, that when Jesus was hung upon the cross, he bore the curse that our sins deserve. Through his death, then, we can find forgiveness. Through his being risen from the dead, it showed that he was indeed the Messiah. What we have here is not a contradiction. What we have here is just not an understanding of good Christian theology. And of course, any other contradictions, many of them have to do with um, uh, archaeological uh, discrepancies, so it's claimed, but what we find time and time again, in fact, something just came out this past week. It seems like every year are rolled out new ones where people have said for a long time, you know, the Bible can't be true because it claims this city was over here and we know that city wasn't there, or it claims that this person went to this place and we know that they didn't go there. And then archaeologists suddenly discover that city exactly where the Bible said it was, or discover an inscription in that city by the person that the Bible claimed had in fact gone there and time and time again People have to say, oh, I guess we were the ones that were wrong. And so this should all bring us comfort in our daily lives, because if the scriptures are true, and if they are infallible, if they do not contradict one another, and if they are the words of God, who is a promise-keeping God, how many promises does, do the word, does the word have for us daily? And so we true turn to the word, and we lean upon his promises, and they bring us daily comfort. But here is the important point that Paul is driving at in his sermon. If God has been true to his promises in the past, you can count on him being true to his promises that are yet to be fulfilled. And we see that in verse 38. Let it be known therefore. So Paul says, okay, here's the point. I've walked you through the history of God's dealings with his people. He's shown himself to be faithful to his promises. Therefore, therefore what, Paul? Because God has shown himself to be faithful to everything that he has said before, and because he promised that he would send a Savior, and that that Savior would sit on the throne of David, and that the Savior would suffer and die and yet live once again. 
And since these things he promised hundreds of years before Jesus ever set foot on the earth were fulfilled in him to a T, we have every reason to believe that the promises that still stand will be fulfilled exactly the way that he said. And what are they? First, those who believe will find forgiveness of sins and freedom through Christ. This is verse 38 through 39. And secondly, those who will not believe will be astonished when they see the promises fulfilled and they will perish. And this is a quote of Habakkuk 1.5. So very quickly, to finish up, let's consider this. For those of Paul's audience, when he's talking to them, they are very well acquainted with their own guilt before a holy God. I mean, they were concerned about their standing before him. And so the promise of forgiveness was one that they would have longed to hear. And it would have struck them as amazing that God accomplished it through the sending of his son. And so we see this in verse 42, where it says the crowds begged Paul and Barnabas to continue this conversation. And in verse 43, it says that they followed Paul and Barnabas out of the synagogue, continuing the conversation. Uh, today, things are a little bit different. I was talking to a pastor from Zambia once, and Zambia claims to be a Christian nation, and so he says everybody there assumes that they're a Christian. And he was saying that his hardest job as a pastor in Zambia is convincing people of their need for a Savior. In other words, convincing them that they're actually not Christians at all. He says they simply trust that because they live in a Christian nation and because they might go to church every so often that they are okay with God. And of course, the same thing is true here in the States. Rick and I were just talking about this the other day. He said before he came to Christ, he assumed he was a Christian because he says, what else would I be? Certainly, well, I wasn't Hindu. I wasn't Muslim. Well, what other choice is there? I'm a Christian. And that's where a lot of people are today. And so despite Paul's clearness in what he's saying here, I think most people today, they would hear Paul's words here in this sermon regularly, and they'd say, okay, well, cool. Okay, I'm good. God sent Jesus. And that's where we need to hone in on the idea of belief. When Paul uses the word belief in verse 39, everyone who believes is free, that's the promise. What does he mean by belief? Most people today would say that they believe in God or in Jesus. And so you ask them, you know, are you a Christian? And, well, yeah, I believe in Jesus. But that's not the question. James tells us in chapter 2, verse 19 of his book, you believe that God is one, you do well. And he's saying, okay, so you, you, you believe in God. That's your claim. You believe in God. Well, that's okay as far as it goes. But then he says, even the demons believe and shudder. So you say you believe in God? You say you believe in Jesus? The demons believe in God. The devil believes in Jesus. He tempted Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. But both demons and the devil are all going to go to hell. Believing in God, believing in Jesus, doesn't save anyone. The belief that Paul is talking about here is something more. What James will say is that words are empty. You say you believe in them, but... If you truly believe, that belief will be marked by life change, by actions which demonstrate the fruit of belief. It's like Jesus will say in John 14, he says, truly, truly, which whenever Jesus says that, that means pay attention. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. In verse 15, he will say, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. In verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. And then he talks about, this, he uses this language of abiding. And he paints a picture about a vine and its branches. And he says, I'm the vine. I'm the vine. And you must abide in me as a branch 
abides on its vine. In other words, it, needs, in other words it, it remains, it stays, it's connected in a way in which it rece receives life, in a way in which it produces fruit because of this connection. He says, if that's not true of you, then you're nothing more than a snapped off, like a snapped off twig laying on a ground, not connected to the vine. He says it this way, for chapter 15, verses 4 through 6. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. So this idea of belief, or believing, is more than believing in. But it's about being connected to Christ. In a life-giving, fruitful, enduring way, demonstrated by the bearing of the fruit of obedience in your lives. And of course, that's not where a lot of people who say they believe in Jesus are. They say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. They might even say, yeah, I know he's talked about in the Bible. He has something about him dying on a cross and something about him rising from the dead and that there's a heaven. And because they believe that, they think they're okay. But we need to understand that no one receives forgiveness because they believe there was a Jesus. One must not simply believe in him, but believe in who he is and what he did and who he called us to be. He is the Son of God. He has simply lived a perfect life. He was crucified. The sins of the elect placed upon his body. He bore the wrath of God in our place. He died, was buried, rose again, is now seated at the right hand of the Father, will return to gather his own to himself and to rule over the new heavens and the new earth. Apart from his sacrifice in our place, our sins remain upon us and we remain condemned for them. This Jesus deserves our praise, our worship, and our lives and evidence that we really believe this is our abiding in him, our keeping his commandments. And does anybody do this perfectly? Of course not. We are all sinners. We live in fallen bodies in this fallen world. But the evidence that you believe, that you truly believe, is that you long to be obedient to the commandments. You strive to be obedient to the commandments. You desire to be obedient. Obedient to his commandments. And when you're not, it grieves you. And you know that your only hope is in his grace and mercy. But on the other hand, if you just blow that off, Paul says that there is a promise that still remains for you. Just as God has spoken through the promise, prophets to prophesy the coming of Christ, so God made a promise to those who would not believe. Those who scoff, he says, will be astounded when God's word comes true and they find that they are condemned to perish. Remember John 15 when Jesus said, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. I mean, those are the words of Jesus himself. And he has been faithful to all his promises thus far. Will he not be faithful to that one? In fact, in Revelation 20, 11 through 15, what do we find? We're going to close on this. <coughs> then I saw a great white throne. This is John writing. And him who was seated on it, from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And as I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were in, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. 
And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And there it is in black and white. And the amazing thing is, as Paul points out, the word promises that there will be those who will be facing that, and they will be astonished, shocked even, surprised. But is not God a promise-keeping God? The only way this can be a surprise is because you were not listening. Are you listening to the promises of God? Do you believe the promises of God? What will you do with the promises of God? Come, believe upon Christ. Confess with your mouth. Be baptized. Live 